So welcome to the, oh, and I'll try not to tip over the microphone. Welcome to the inaugural panel of the Classics and Social Justice Working Group. Um, congratulations on being here. And if you are not here, but watching via the internet somewhere, welcome, we wish you were here. Just so everyone knows, I believe this panel is being recorded for the SCS website. Um, so think about that if you speak up and don't want to be recorded. Um, so my name is Jessica Wright, and together with my invisible co-moderator, Amit Shiloh, I am responsible for bringing together the papers on this panel, and we have some really wonderful papers today. We have three panelists present, two panelists via Skype. If we can't get the Skype to work, we have a recording of one of the papers, and if we can't get the recording to work, we also have the papers, so we may be looking for audience, volunteers, and participation at some point. Welcome, Nancy. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot right now because we have a lot to get on with, but just in case there are people in the room who don't already know the Classics and Social Justice group, I wanted to say maybe two or three sentences about it. Um, we're an SDS-affiliated group. We're fairly young. We started somewhere between 2014 and 2016 through a series of different conversations involving different groups of people, but we are flourishing. We had a full house yesterday evening. We had no more chairs left, maybe 40 people, 50 people, I don't remember, in the middle of snowy Boston. So it's an exciting group to be part of. If you want to be part of the Classics and Social Justice Working Group, we have a sign-up list, which Nancy Rabinovitz is holding. Please put down your name, your email address, and you can indicate whether you would just like to receive annoying emails from us or if you would like to actively volunteer and do things on the committee. Please print. <laughs> so our scope is very broad, but we seek to provide space for folks who are interested in doing work towards social justice or who already have social justice projects of many, many different kinds. Um, we network, we collaborate, we support one another, and we're trying to generate resources and ideas for new projects. Um, that's all I have to say. I'm going to introduce our first panelist who is here, Alina Salminen. Um, so Alina is an advanced fellow at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. She's expecting her PhD from the University of Michigan in 2018 in the Interdepartmental Program of Classical Art and Archaeology. So at Michigan, besides her research, she has served as a community-based learning consultant at the Center for Engaged Academic Learning, where she provides specialist support for faculty members developing courses with a community-based learning component. And that's the project she's going to talk about today. And so Alina's paper is called At Intersections, Teaching About Power and Powerlessness in the Ancient and Modern World. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Jess, and thanks for everyone um, for being here. Um, so this paper actually details the community-based learning aspect of a course that I taught uh, last winter uh, on inequality in classical Greece and in modern-day U.S. Um, as you can tell by the title and in case you read my abstract, by my abstract, I initially um, planned to discuss the course much more broadly, but it would seem um, inauspicious to go grossly over time as the first speaker of the morning. Um, so um, instead, I'm only focusing on the collaborations we had with off-campus groups and how I incorporated community-based learning into my pedagogical practice. Um, I did bring um, copies of my syllabus, so afterwards I'd be more than happy to discuss the primary and secondary sources um, that I used for my course. There are also handouts. I'm not sure if there's enough for everyone. Um, if not, please share. They have some uh, bibliography as well as some of the quotes I'll be discussing later on um, in my presentation. Um, I want to emphasize from the get-go that even though I am trained in community-based learning pedagogy, designing a course on social justice was not easy and it was not an obvious choice uh, for me to tackle. Um, and I'm saying this because I know some of you have a lot of experience with doing social justice-oriented work and working with off-campus um, organizations, while others might be considering it but feeling, you know, some slight trepidation about the whole thing. Um, 
So I'm hoping that my presentation will explain why it's worth to take the plunge. Um, and I will also discuss some of the challenges that I tackled and, and how I try to navigate those. Um, and finally, I'm hoping to get uh, feedback from you on how to improve in the future. I will begin with a very brief description of the course, followed by my motivations for teaching it. I will then I'll move to the community-based learning aspect of the course, uh, first briefly explaining what community-based learning or CBL is, um, and then the rest of the paper discusses the practicalities of the course I taught. Um, so I will first tackle the balance of CBL and sort of conventional bread and butter subject-specific content. Um, I will then describe the CBL work that we did step by step, and finally I will close with the outcomes of the course. Um, this slide shows you the class description from my syllabus, and it's also um, on the handout. Um, in brief, the course studied examples of inequality from classical Greece and modern day US, covering many groups of people and many facets of identity, such as gender and ethnicity. The examples covered everything from the status of hetairai in classical Athens to human trafficking in contemporary Michigan. But the goal was to make meaningful, substantive comparisons between inequality in the ancient and modern worlds. We looked at sources ranging from Aristotle to archaeological reports and from bar graphs to blog posts. In addition, there were collaborations with off-campus groups, which will be the focus of my um, current presentation. So we had visiting speakers come to our class um, from organizations promoting social justice. And the capstone project for the course was a small set of visits to an after-school program to teach K-8 to youth um, about the ancient world. So as you can see, the scope of the course was ambitious, to say the least. Um, but I really felt compelled uh, to design it the way I did for a few different reasons. So prior to designing the course, I was at times frustrated with a lack of student engagement and my students struggling to see the pertinence of classics to their lives. Um, I wanted to move beyond off-handed comparisons to truly testing how we can use the past as a tool to think with about modern day US. And conversely, I wanted to see whether we could use the modern theory of intersectionality uh, fruitfully um, in the context of the ancient world. I was also pre-fired up about social justice discussion happening on the University of Michigan campus in the aftermath of several racist incidents. So um, I really wanted to encourage my students to truly engage and grapple with issues of social justice based both on facts and their own experiences. Mainly, however, um, I wanted to expand the walls of the campus bubble a little bit um, and see if we could incorporate classics in work that was meaningful to communities off campus. Um, and finally, and importantly, Michigan has a community-engaged community academic learning center who offer training, support, and resources to instructors interested in doing this kind of work. Um, I cannot thank them enough for their help, and I encourage all of you to reach out to similar units uh, within your institutions, which are popping up very rapidly, um, I must say. So I've been using the term community-based learning throughout this paper, so I think it's high time to explain um, what it means and what its implications are. CBL, sometimes referred to as service learning, can refer to any learning activities that go beyond the traditional campus and which allow students to engage with and apply content that they have learned. So this could be collaborating on projects with off-campus entities, it could be doing research to support an organization, volunteering for a nonprofit, and so on and so forth. Um, importantly, however, the CBL community has developed best practices that distinguish well-done CBL from simply sending students off to a community and hoping they'll learn something and not cause too much damage. Um, and I believe um, Amy Pistoni via Skype or however, th whatever the delivery will be like, uh, will be talking about exactly this topic. So I will not discuss it in my paper, but I look forward to a fruitful discussion on it later on. Now that we have a broad idea of what CBL is, I want to delve into the nitty gritty. Um, before describing the CBL work we did step by step, however, I want to focus on one aspect that is a common source of anguish and angst um, among people wanting to incorporate CBL work into their teaching, myself very much included in this group. How on earth to fit the bread and butter subject specific conventional content in while also making room for CBL? So I will justify and describe some of the choices I made, as well as provide tips on how to make covering the material more feasible. In addition to having a CBL component, the theme of my course was very broad, power and powerlessness in uh, classical Greece and in modern day US. 
Um, this resulted not only in some pushback from my colleagues, but also some real scheduling challenges. Um, the slide here shows you uh, the different elements of my course, and as you can see, it is an awful lot. Um, as soon as I began to fit things into a weekly schedule of two hour classes twice a week, so four hours total per week, I realized a lot of compromises would be necessary. And these compromises were mainly done in terms of the ancient material covered. Um, in order for CBL to be responsible, significant amounts of time need to be dedicated to it, not just to the CBL work itself, but to scaffolding, preparation, and reflection. Making room in the schedule for CBL was initially discomforting, but once I had clearly outlined my main goals and priorities, it really ceased to be a concern for me. And while each instructor makes his or her own compromises, I recommend coming to terms with the fact that CBL courses require different priorities earlier rather than later on in the process. This pie chart here uh, shows you my compromise. So each element is shown, shown proportionate to how much time was devoted to it. Um, although I want to emphasize that since all the different facets were integrated, it really is kind of an artificial division. Um, hopefully, you will be comforted by the fact that almost half uh, of the pie, so the orange slice, uh, is dedicated to the ancient world. Uh, the blue, the green, and the purple slices are related to CBL work. The beige um, stands for conventional classes on modern day US, so lecture or um, seminar discussion style classes. And the red is a combination of theoretical frameworks and introduction to the course. In case the idea of chopping off weeks worth of lessons on ancient authors fills you with dread, which is fair enough, um, I want to share some ways in which I tried to strike a balance between giving the students the information they needed without overwhelming them. First, I began the course with two sessions on source criticism. We looked at text passages, inscriptions, vast painting, and archaeological case studies to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of each category of evidence. This seemed remarkably helpful in equipping the students to read sources carefully during the rest of the course and remove the need to sort of keep rehashing this uh, point over and over again. Secondly, I chose to mostly use primary sources, and in one sense, this made things easy. Um, it's much faster to read one paragraph of Aristotle than read a scholarly article explaining that one paragraph by Aristotle. Um, but at the same time, it shifted a lot of the burden onto me to carefully select and scaffold the sources. Um, so I created glossaries, I wrote up summaries and introductions to help students make sense of what they were reading and seeing. And I also gave brief lectures to provide them with a better rounded picture of a given topic. For the contemporary comparative element, I was also able to draw on videos, blog posts, and newspaper articles to provide information to students in a concise way that for many of them was more palatable than reading scholarly articles. Finally, the fact that the class was very small and run seminar style greatly helped. Um, the students were all engaged, they were asking a ton of questions, and I could adjust the pace on the go. So now that you've seen the big pie picture, I want to zoom in to some of the slices and walk you through the CBL components step by step. As already mentioned, there were two main modules to it. So we had visiting speakers from nonprofit organizations come to our class. Um, and then we had two visits to teach about ancient Greece to two separate after school programs, both run by Avalon Housing, which is a local nonprofit organization supporting families that have experienced homelessness based in Ann Arbor. The visiting speakers came from Planned Parenthood, ACLU, and the Washington Juvenile Detention Program. I met up or spoke on the phone with each of them prior to the visits. And during a previous lesson, we would typically cover a relevant topic. So for example, abortion in antiquity before the Planned Parenthood um, visit or contemporary human trafficking in Michigan prior to the um, juvenile uh, detention system visit. I would ask the students to read materials provided by the speakers and to prepare and post online their questions to the speaker. The speakers would then take over the class. Some of them chose to do PowerPoint presentations, others had a more open discussion format. Um, at the end, the students would ask questions and after the speaker left, we would have a wrap up discussion to unpack whatever thoughts had arisen from the visit. As for the collaboration with Avalon Housing's after school program, it was greatly facilitated by the fact that I had volunteered with them for a year, so I knew the staff, the youth, and the kind of work they do. I began by meeting up with a program director well in advance to discuss different options. Um, this turned out to be a very crucial step and it helped guide my own ideas for collaboration. For example, to ensure that the activities and topics we covered, um, unlike much of what 
we did in class would be uplifting rather than upsetting. I introduced the idea of CBL to students in the very first class, and we continue to touch on it throughout the course. A visit by the after-school program director to our class early on in the semester turned out to be a particularly crucial piece. Talking face-to-face -to, -face to a representative of the program kickstarted the students into planning the activities in a serious and driven way. The students then wrote up detailed lesson plans for their visits that we shared with the program for feedback. The activities they designed included a game of knuckle bones, which turns out is very useful math practice, um, reading and discussion of the myth of Pandora, discussion of and drawing ancient houses, and introduction to ancient pottery and the youth making their own versions out of Play-Doh. We did a complete run through of each visit in class beforehand, which might seem like overkill, but we quickly discovered that even things like introductions require planning to run smoothly with a group of 15 youth, especially if they skew young, which they did in our, in our case. I attended each of the visits, but mostly in a fly on the wall capacity. Finally, um, we discussed the visits with the after school program staff immediately after each visit. Um, we also discussed the visits in class afterwards and the students wrote reflections on it. In total, the after-school visits took up two full weeks of classes, as well as time spent preparing things over the course of the semester. Now, the rest of this paper is dedicated to the outcomes of the course. I will, however, begin with who the course attracted. Um, as is common uh, for classes at the residential college, which is the unit where I taught, the class size was small with five students. All but one were women. Three out of the five people in the class self-identified as people of color, despite Michigan being a predominantly white campus and the humanities skewing particularly white. What was the biggest surprise for me was the fact that none of the students had any background in classics or related disciplines. So they had all basically stumbled across this class and decided to take it to fulfill their humanities requirement. Furthermore, only one of my students said they actively thought about or worked on topics of social justice. So for me, attracting students who were not already familiar with the issues or drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak, uh, was in and of itself an important and positive outcome. Now, um, on to the more specific outcomes of the class. Um, CBL is a rapidly developing field, but there are some longitudinal and large-scale studies on its efficacy. Common outcomes include shifts in values, increased empathy, and increased desire to participate in social justice-oriented work. Outcomes pertaining to content learning are more mixed. Some studies indicate students learn more deeply and effectively, especially on projects where they are asked to apply the learned content. Um, other studies, however, suggest that in the process of getting invested in CBL and social justice work, students might lose some of their motivation to study conventional content or even lose some of their interest in the entire topic being studied. My experience was consistent with most of these findings. Um, there was often a push and pull as the student wanted to tip the roughly 50-50 balance to almost entirely modern day issues. Um, the seminar style format and weekly short writing assignments ensure the students obtained a very decent level of content knowledge about the ancient world, but it was clear emotions were at times driving their learning. So students could um, remember a sense of shock or surprise, but they couldn't remember the details of exactly what had shocked um, or surprised them. To counter this, I realized I needed to guide the discussion more and provide more scaffolding and repetition. So I would generally prompt the students over and over again to give me concrete, detailed examples to support their statements about the ancient and modern world. And they eventually got there, but the impression I got was that because there were bigger themes involved, tidbits that seemed so important to us as scholars were at times felt to be of secondary importance by the students. And to some degree, I would agree um, so my students wrote reflections um, on the community-based learning elements as well as the comparative modules. And based on these reflections, the things my students gained from the course are much more important than knowing who wrote against Naira, which we don't know anyways. Um, and uh, from these reflections, I have um, identified a handful of themes. So I've included more extensive quotes in the handouts, mostly because I love them so much. So I wanted to share them <laughs> with all of you to brag. Uh, but I will um, here just go over them quickly and give some examples. So first, um, the students felt that the CBL component helped solidify their learning and also encouraged them to explore new topics. Um, so here is one student saying how um, preparing for the after-school visits helped cement things she had already learned. But there's another student who noted that because in coming up with activities and designing them, they had to do research, they were actually expanding the knowledge um, of the ancient world as well. 
Secondly, um, because the CBL component um, consisted of teaching K-8 youth, um, the students also learned a great deal about how to teach effectively. And they also showed admirable awareness of the after-school youth's learning. So here I have two quotes, and the first one uh, has to do with the Play-Doh pottery activity that we had. So we were talking about the um, functional dis um, distinction between open shapes and closed shapes. And one of, the, one of my students noticed that when... Um, when the youth were making the uh, vessels, they would consistently put uh, blue Play-Doh in the open shapes and little balls of Play-Doh uh, in the closed shape. So not only had the youth um, learned this, you know, rather scholarly functional uh, distinction that we make um, as archaeologists, my student had, you know, enough um, pedagogical acumen to observe this and, you know, feel, feel like her teaching had been effective. The second quote um, is much more about sort of genuine... A genuine moment of connection and empowerment. So these after-school programs can often be um, pretty restless, uh, kind of noisy, um, but the student was reading the myth of uh, Pandora to the students, and all of a sudden, the, the youth just went quiet, and they were all listening. Um, and afterwards, um, they were asking questions, and the student was able to answer them. So for her, it was this beautiful moment of connection, but also empowerment and realizing how much she had learned about the ancient world because she was able to answer the student's question and felt like a competent instructor. Um, so for her, it was a really um, empowering experience. The students uh, reported learning many transferable skills, and they also identified specific ways in which these skills could be useful for them in the future. Teamwork, flexibility, and communication were especially frequently mentioned. In addition, um, centering the community partners helped the students show accountability and maturity in a way they frankly do not always show in class. I was really impressed with the students' ability to recognize and take ownership of their own shortcomings. So in this quote, not only um, does the student acknowledge that, oh, not showing up to class, not communicating with my partner didn't work out, my fault, um, but they also take the additional um, step of, well, this is how I could improve. This is what I could do in the future. We should have just divvied up the work. We should have communicated better, problem solved, which I think is pretty admirable. Um, um, next up, um, certain comparative topics hit close to home and made the students reevaluate their own communities, but also their approach to the ancient world. Our discussion on human trafficking in our home state of Michigan elicited especially strong reactions. And I'm going to read this quote uh, in its entirety just because I think it's so powerful. The modern day examples really shook me. It felt too real, and the idea of slavery in my own backyard of girls my age really freaked me out a lot. I feel like learning about slavery in ancient Greece is such a separate topic for me because it feels just like history of something that just happened or was a product of its time. When I read Aristotle, these are the excuses I personally give him for his views on slavery. However, is this what future generations will say about our huge human trafficking problem nowadays? That we didn't know better and are simply the product of our times? We should be putting more efforts into stopping human trafficking because things being the product of our time is just a terrible excuse for us not being proactive enough as a society to make change. Now, I feel like I could give an entire paper just on, on, on this quote, but so the student here is doing this really intricate movement to and fro between the ancient and modern worlds and using both of them to shed light on the other and using it to question her values and assumptions, both about her um, own community as well as the ancient world. Um, and not only that, but she takes the additional step from being shocked and, and appalled to saying, we need to be proactive, we need to make change. So she is starting the shift from, um, yeah, from moral outrage to activism, which just frankly blew me, blew me away. Finally, um, the students all agreed that community-based learning should be incorporated into more courses. Um, so here I would turn your attention, um, especially to the second quote, um, where a student basically discovered that for her, working with off-campus um, communities was the best way, not only to learn, but also to grow as a human being. Um, she really enjoyed the hands-on aspect of it um, and really wanted to keep working with these organizations and really found it meaningful. So I think she kind of found, found her thing um, in community-based learning. In conclusion, 
The golden ideal often cited in the literature on community-based learning is transformation. CBL can, at its best, be transformative, changing the views, values, motivations, and goals of a student, impacting them long after the course has ended. I cannot know what my students will do a year or five or 20 from now, but I think the outcomes described in this presentation show that the course made the students think differently about ancient Greece, their own communities, and the kind of work they can do as members of those communities. And that, to me, seems transformative enough. Thank you. Yes, please. Ask away. Nothing? Uh, yes, in the back and then... So, uh, I have a question about uh, your use of comparative material mm -hmm. moving from the ancient to the modern. Um, I went by the part of a conference recently where um, uh, colleagues of African-American studies got very angry about classicists comparison between say mm -hmm. ancient between ancient slavery mm -hmm. and modern slavery. Um, and I realized how uh, we can just looking within our own discipline uh, get it very wrong mm -hmm. um, when it comes to to the comparison between um, ancient and modern. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you consider this at all um, for example when you want to move between ancient modern traffic and uh, if so, what you do to avoid, um, uh, you know, misguided scholarship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um... And I'm not sure if I have an ideal response to it. I think it's definitely, it's something I'm aware of and something I've thought about. Um, I think one way, oh, a few ways that I try to um, be at least a little bit more thoughtful is about, first of all, dedicate time to it. Because a lot of time, what we do in class is we have these very sort of five minute comparisons, um, which kind of reduces things to a, to a stick figure picture. Um, so first of all, you know, like in order to make meaningful comparisons, you need to devote enough time, time to it. And the other thing is exactly reaching out, um, to communities, reaching out to organizations doing social justice oriented work, bring in their expertise rather than just, you know, pretending to be an, an expert on topics that, that I'm not. So those are kind of the two um, main things I can think of that I did, but there is definitely much more thinking I should be doing and we should all be doing. So thank you for that comment. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing that is formalized at the level of University of Michigan. Um, in contrast to if, if you're doing interviews, that there is a very specific protocol and training for it. So everything, I, like I basically had to um, come up with it. Um, so the big step was bringing in the program director early on um, to have a conversation um, you know, what is the background, what are the demographics, how, how old are the youth, so sort of really basic questions, but also, you know, things we should be aware of when we design um, these activities. And then I also gave um, an orientation to CBL work, kind of more generally talking about some of the um, the guiding principles that we should be aware of, that we are doing it, we should be doing it for the community and as a collaboration um, yeah, so I basically came up with things that there's no formalized process um, at University of Michigan, at least not so far. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lina, for this wonderful presentation and congratulations. Uh, I just love the project. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about your experience uh, volunteering, because you have said that uh, you were volunteering one year before. Mm -hmm. So my, my, uh, my question should be, uh, how did the uh, entire idea of this project come to your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I assume it happened when you were volunteering. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, that's basically, so I think it was just, you know, lucky happenstance kind of that I was already involved with this organization. And then I started thinking about uh, community-based learning and designing my own course. And I was like, well, I could reach out to um, other organizations, but since I already have a connection uh, with this one organization, so um, so it, it really is kind of as, as simple as that, um, is that I was already familiar with the mission um, and it kind of, yeah, it dovetailed very nicely. Um, yeah, um, uh, to it. Uh, I find this very important to that mm -hmm. some topic we were discussing in the media yesterday is uh, what do we do? Mm -hmm. uh, to find out what do we do, we have to be previously involved in the community as you were, otherwise right. it, just, it just doesn't come out like that. Right, that's true, yeah. Um, and I think that's a very good point. And I think the the reason I talked so much about scheduling um, in my presentation, which might seem like why are you talking about logistics and scheduling, is like for me the big realization was really the importance of time. Like developing this course, frankly, took me forever. Um, not only in terms of the hours put in, but also like it took me two years to you know start thinking about things and you know for the pieces slowly to. Um, to fall fall into place, so um, yeah, it's yeah, it's something you have to cultivate and kind of give give it time. Oh. <laughs>